days, I guess, more than anything, uh, because they are all extremely busy persons. A few years ago, I was in my living room down in Virginia uh, before I came here and saw this uh, film called Contradictions, uh, which we're going to talk about in a second, uh, which I found highly impressive. I have uh, for years worked as an environmental activist uh, within mostly communities of color uh, trying to kind of help raise the capacity of that community to deal with their own environmental challenges. And I've had a lot of alliances with a lot of good groups, and I learned a lot from that process. But also sometimes the difficulty in an area where there are multiple narratives and multiple desires to figure out how to put that together. And uh, when I watched Contradictions, uh, the movie that was created by Jeremiah Kamara, the man sitting to my left here, uh, I realized, wow, he's got some really important things to say about this. In fact, he has uh, quite a uh, extensive amount of things that he's put online that you could explore as well. And I reached out to him down in Atlanta, Georgia, down in Hotlanta, and he said uh, definitely that he'd like to come up here, and here we have him. He is the author of the books called Holy Lockdown, Does the Church Limit Black Progress? And New Doubting Thomas, The Bible, Black Folk, and Blind Belief. Kamara is a creator of the widely watched YouTube video series Slave Sermons. And the last time I looked, he has 13,000 subscribers who actually tune into his podcast and his blogs and things like that. And when he's in other groups, uh, I saw on the Monique show, uh, some of us follow the, uh, her as well, uh, 22,000 tuned in eventually to watch that show of him talking. So this is a man who has much to say uh, and uh, people are listening to him. He is the creator of a full-length documentary film called Contradictions, A Question of Faith, and we had a video showing uh, that last night, in which he examines the saturation of churches in African American communities, coexisting also with power and powerlessness. And he's the director of the documentary film, Holy Hierarchy, The Religious Roots of Racism in America. And he's in the middle of a yet a third or fourth movie you're working on. Third one that he's working on as well. Um, Holy Hierarchy explains, which you can also get on Amazon Prime, explains how the beliefs in a supreme being during colonial America ultimately turned racism into an institution. So he has a really great critical mind. He's been looking at these issues, and I thought, let's invite him up. He'll give a presentation. We'll have a brief time. We can't get to everybody's questions, and please just understand that. We're just trying to get a flavor. You can always just go and watch his blogs. We'll have a question and area period after that. So I'd like to call up Jeremiah Kamara. All right, I guess my mic is on. Good morning to everyone. I am so honored to be here. Thank you for, for, for being here as well. I hope you all enjoyed the film Contradiction uh, last night. I want to encourage you to also watch Holy Hierarchy uh, on Amazon. Uh, Kurt, thanks for inviting me. I appreciate that. And thank you to Jim and Ginger for picking me up and, and dropping me off and taking me back to the airport. <laughs> I don't know if it's you, but we'll get there. And thanks to the whole Susan Lesh and, and, and the whole organization here. So I really appreciate that. Um, when Kurt asked me to, to come here, and I hope uh, Eric Adams is going to be watching this. He really just, you know, you're talking about taking two steps back. This is just ridiculous that we're here in 2023 and he's talking like, you know, the 1600s. This is ridiculous. It's embarrassing. Um, but Kurt's suggestion, suggestion for my topic today, and it'll be brief because we don't have a lot of time. I don't think I've ever done a 20 minute talk before, but uh, we'll make it happen. I've never seen this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he said, does the dominant culture have a right to criticize? And I thought, wow, that is a really cool question. And I, I really like that because um, it, it segues right into my upcoming documentary. 
and my uh, documentary is entitled The Age of Appeasement. And I think that's what we're in right now. We're in an age of appeasement for black people. And I just want to give you guys an understanding because we all live amongst each other. We have to understand one another in order to make progress. And I think th this whole thing with Eric Adams is just indicative of a mindset that is shared by so many African Americans and why religion is just so much a part of our daily lives. I mean, for many years, blacks didn't even realize that we could be critical of religion. We didn't know we could question religion, you know. I got in trouble growing up, and you saw in the film Contradiction that we, we God was a, 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 a the black woman with a belt. You know, so if you said anything wrong, you would get reprimanded for it. So I thought it was a good topic. But the answer to that question is yes, you have a right to criticize anything that you want. But I think what we need to have is some understanding of what's going on because it's amazing that black people have the same net worth today as we had in the 1800s, in 1865 and 1866. The net worth hasn't grown. Something is going on. So, but when you look at the TV and the commercials, it appears as though things have changed, you know. It is rare to see a black person uh, to, uh, to, to not see a black in commercials. I dare you to even try. If you, I mean, if you go two or three commercials and you don't see a black in it, give me a call, please. I don't understand how we're 13, 12 or 13% of the population, but we're in like 95% of all the commercials. And the death of George Floyd, to me, ushered in the age of appeasement. Appeasement is a political strategy to kind of placate the, uh, the feelings of, the, of the, the, the class that is on the bottom to make them a, feel as though that they're gaining footage and a foothold in society. But in reality, it's not. We can, I guess, I mean, you know, I don't want to comp this is not segregation, but it kind of sort of is still segregation because the money is not integrated. And anytime you still have this big, wide economic gap, it's still kind of segregated, you know. And so, as I was explaining last night, I'm involved in the cannabis space. And it was supposed to be an equal opportunity. You know, here we are in, in Atlanta, which is 75% black the city. It's about 30% black the metro area. And we were supposed to have equal bidding. Well, we wake up one morning and there are already six distributors, six cultivators, and six manufacturers, and none of them are black. And that's what racism does. It's this closed door politics, this country club, private type of deals that go on that is really out of our hands. And so my film is, is going to address that. You know, I want to just get back to, 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 to Eric Adam. I'm going to be all over the place here like I normally am. Uh, but you know, the biggest con that there is in religion is when you believe that what you believe is greater than what you do. That's when you know you're conned. That's the first con job is what I believe is more important than what I do. I have, you know, I have a business. I've hired 22 felons in my business. And right now is the only time where I don't have felons working for me. And I am a non-believer, you could, you know, I say I'm shaft. It's an acronym for a secular, humanist, atheist, free thinker. <laughs> so I'm all of that, okay? I understand all of that, but what you do is, is much greater than what you believe. Now, you know, that, that title, 
the dominant class. I think that's a euphemism. We all can agree with, we know who the dominant class is. But I guess there are hierarchical lines in all social animals. There, there are gonna be some that own the windows and some that watch the windows. And I don't know if we can do anything about that. I'm not one to actually complain. I'm a doer. But I want to give us some understanding of why things are the way they are today. If you look at the industries that have happened here in this country, blacks had no part of these industries. The cotton industry, obviously. The tobacco industry, obviously. The precious metal industry, the steel industry we were kept out of, the textile industry, the food industry, the tool making industry, and even today, the digital industry. And then now with this $80 billion industry that is on the rise called cannabis, racism is trying to keep blacks out of that as well. Because to open up a dispensary, you couldn't even have a felony. And so that's going to eliminate tons of black people, you know. And I remember reading about, you know, the three strikes and you're out law that they had. How a lot of white uh, youth, a lot of white young men uh, who committed crimes, the judge made sure that he did not label this crime a felony so they would not have three strikes. This is what's going on. This is why it's very hard and difficult to get a foothold in society. And this is why blacks tend to use supernatural uh, means in order to uh, achieve things. I don't even watch sports anymore, Harley, you know, because it's turned into a big religious show. <laughs> Step Curry is now the three point leader and he, after a free throw, he points up, dude, your dad was an NBA player and your mom was a missionary. So you're in that position for a reason. But, uh, you know, to me, this is just my opinion here, and I'm going to try to put this in the film as, as best I can. But to me, racism has to be. I'm going to repeat that. Racism has to be. And you might think I'm crazy saying that, but you know, think about it for a minute. There is a lot invested to maintain a society to where some have privilege and then some don't. The Civil War lost almost a half a million people. Lives were lost. Imagine the lives of, I don't have the exact number, but you know that there were a lot of lives lost during colonial uh, colonization period of Africa, of the Africans who fought back. A lot of people died. Racism has to be because if it isn't a system of racism, which is the law, racism is, is a law because apartheid was a legal thing. Jim Crow was a legal thing. If I'm walking down the street and someone beats me up and calls me the N-word, that's not, that could be hatred, that could be prejudice. It's not racism until it goes to court and it's upheld. Racism is the legal backing of one's prejudices, one's ignorance, one's bigotry. And, and once that's backed, it becomes racism. And that's what's been happening in America. You can go to the judge as a black person and you can say, look, I'm sorry I did this. My mother was on drugs. My father, um, I never saw him. I was born in a community where I heard gunshots, et cetera, et cetera. That judge will still give you 30 years. And that's just the way it is. But I'm one to think, I don't want to give the film away. I don't think it should stop us. We have 85,000 predominantly black churches in this country, and we are squandering a lot of time in this country 
with all of this religious stuff instead of getting down to the business at hand. It's crazy because you might have a church here and it might be littering trash just a few yards away from the church. I think that we should go out the outside and pick up the trash in our neighborhood. That would be something that would that we can do, you know, instead of sitting in there. Because when you go inside of a black church, oh, it looks good, it smells good. It, it's not reflective of a lot of the community that we have. But, you know, um, to render, to, 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 to say, to, to, to have aspirations to end racism is to render slavery in vain. You didn't have 400 years of slavery to turn around and then share everything equally. You know, if you stole the land, you stole the people, you stole the resources, that wasn't done to turn around years later and say, okay, we're gonna divide it with everybody equally. No, that is to give certain groups privilege and upper hand. There was something called the Maryland Doctrine of Exclusion. I think it was 1689, I think it was. Well, that was adopted. The Maryland Doctrine of Exclusion said that blacks would be a working class group, non-competitive workforce for the benefit and would not be allowed to benefit in the fruits of white society. Well, the other colonies looked at that Maryland Doctrine of Exclusion and they adopted that. And they adopted it so much that it worked its way into the actual slave codes of 1705. And so all of the slave codes adopted that, that there would be no progress, that blacks are intended to be this way. And so you kind of really scratch your head you're like, what is the way out then? What is our solution, you know? And um, to, 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 to say that you want racism is to end, I think that you're asking whites not to participate in their privilege. And I, I just don't think that's gonna happen. Because if I was in that situation, I probably would participate in, in, in my privilege. I'll give an example. My wife and I, we do okay. We do pretty well financially. We went to the bank to try to get $30,000 just to renovate our you know, rental property. Unable to get it. And they didn't even use, we, we own commercial property outright and couldn't even use it as collateral. And I had whites come up to me after the talk that I did in Lexington, in Louisville. They said, you know, I didn't even have a job. You can go on YouTube and see the many whites who did not even have a job and were able to get $100,000. Now, that's participating in the privilege. How can you ask whites not to participate in their privilege? Because I, I probably would do the same thing. You're not gonna turn around and, and look at the bank and say, no, wait a minute, are blacks getting the same thing? Because if they're not getting the same thing, I don't want it. <laughs> Nobody, nobody's gonna do that. I, I just think it's unrealistic to shoot for equality because it's too entrenched. The, it's in the fabric, it's in the soil of America, that's what has made America what it is. You had 400 years of free labor in order to establish a hierarchical system. And that's not gonna change. The, there are three ways really that blacks can really come up, in my opinion. The first way is that you have all of these billion dollar industries in Silicon Valley and places like that where they make blacks the majority owner of their companies. That's not gonna happen. Or you have uh, amalgamation, which we see a lot of that happening, you know, in the, in, the, in the commercials and in the movies and things like that. Or 
you had what is the third what is the third reason i'll get to it but i think i forgot that third reason malcolm x said that racism is like a cadillac it just changes models every year and that is exactly what has happened because the economic status of blacks is 10 times lower than that of whites even actors and actresses you know who have the same body of work blacks and whites the black actors just make less money i'm friends with monique as you saw the film you know monique she's an, she's an actress and she's one of the few actresses who've spoken out against injustice of of, of pay the disparity of of, of pay you know, and all that. And so I'm one to, you know, if you look at my slave sermons, you see that I have a lot of things on TV. So I watch television very strategically. And right now I'm up to like almost 50 commercials. And I want you guys to pay attention to this, right? Every time, 100% of the time where there's a black and a white in a commercial. Now just watch this when you go home, just look at it. 100% of the time it's never failed where there's a black person and a white person in a commercial together, especially in a comedic sense. Blacks are always the smart ones. We're always the ones that, you know, looking at the goofy white person, <laughs> really? And I don't care whether it's a FedEx commercial, I don't care what it is. I'm up to 50 now, and there's no exception. That is appeasement. We're being appeased. If you look at that statement, Black Lives Matter, and I was talking to Jim about this, Jim and Ginger last night about this, and Jim, I agree with you. I think I'm a little harsh when I say that. But I don't like that statement, Black Lives Matter. I understand why they did it but I'm appalled by it. They just matter. I would rather it say black lives are imperative. Black lives are essential. Black lives are crucial. Black lives are necessary. But just to say they matter, to me, it just shows the powerlessness of the black position here. And so, you know, for the religious people, you know, like Eric Adams and many of the religious politicians, it tells you right there in your book, it says a good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit, wherefore ye shall know them by the fruits that they bear. America started out with a bad tree to us. It was a bad tree. You had 400 years of slavery. How can this bad tree produce good fruit? How? You have to just start all over. We're not going to do that, though. It would take a natural disaster. So what do I do? How do I do it with my family? Okay? I'm just, and this is going to be part of the film. One of the problems that I think that blacks have that are perpetuating their status on the bottom we engage in, we're too immersed in white culture and not enough immersed in our own culture. A lot of times, you know, there are many blacks who are asking for reparations. Am I for reparations? Absolutely. Do I think we're gonna get reparations? Absolutely not. But if I come to work the next morning and my pockets are full, just metaphorically speaking, because I've gotten reparations now, and I'm with my good white friend, Kurt. Kurt's going to say, wait a minute, why are your pockets fat? My, my ancestors never participated in slavery. And you got a point there. My grandmother and grandfather never owned any slaves. Jeremiah, why are your pockets fat when you work with me, when we eat together? when we live together, when we have Christmas dinner together. There's no different than you 
Can, can someone give me uh, some water, please, or something? Susan Williams. Thank you. But there's no difference in me than you. You're doing the same thing. And see, that's one of the problems. We would be in a, we would look better. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We would look better somehow if we were asking for reparations, but yet we were different. It would be more justifiable. But how can we ask for reparations when there's really no, we do the same things? Okay, I've been married 33 years, it'll be 34 in June. I have three children. My oldest is 33 years old. She may have been at the wedding. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> My wife will argue with you about that. And I have three grandchildren, right? We've never celebrated Christmas. We've never celebrated Halloween. We've never, I'm a black person. What do I look like putting on green on St. Patrick's Day? I've never celebrated the 4th of July after hearing Frederick Douglass' speech. We've never celebrated Christmas. Christmas only meant a time that the slave did not have to work. And he went to each slave. You read the biography of Frederick Douglass, it's very interesting because he went to the, the slaves during that holiday period and he said, I bet you can't out drink such and such and I bet you can't out drink. And they took him up on his offer and they all got so drunk during the holiday season that they weren't even thinking about insurrection. This is the problem. Just because I don't participate in white culture does not mean I'm anti-white. There is, there is, there is nothing about me. If, if, if I get any black person, I've had some blacks say, I don't, I don't like white people, you know, based off what they did. You show me a black that says they don't like white folk, and I can show you a black who's never been anywhere. They've never done anything. They've never been anywhere. I am in awe with the extraordinary accomplishments of European culture. From science and mathematics to music. You know, we were just, me and Jim and Ginger were riding around near Inglewood last night. And every time I think of Inglewood, I think of one of my favorite musicians, which is Keith Jarrett. I'm in awe. And there's nothing about me that is anti-human being. I am a humanist. But I don't participate in white culture because it has nothing to do with me. And so you might say, well, what is black culture? That is a, that's one of the problems. Because we have been disconnected from our culture, that we don't even know what our culture is. A lot of our culture is dance. A lot of our culture is music. A lot of our culture is food. But I'm trying to think of a culture that is, can produce an economy. For instance, if you live near the mountains, you have a mountain culture. If you live near the river, you have a river culture. If you live near, you know, um, if, if you live in the forest, you have a forest culture. It's no accident that Italians are good at making wine when they were in a Mediterranean climate. That's not an accident. And you had grapes and you had uh, food that could be turned into wine. It's no accident that certain groups have a certain culture based off of where they live. Black people don't have that culture here in the United States. My position is you will know your culture's addition by subtraction by not immersing yourself in someone else's culture. I know that the Irish and the Africans had a very contentious relationship. But blacks don't think twice about putting on green and things on, on St. Patrick's Day. I've been married 34 years in June. I've never bought my wife a piece of candy for Valentine's Day. <laughs> Nothing, no flowers or anything. She knows I love her though. But I'm not Italian. That has nothing to do with me. And 
that's part of white privilege that whites don't have to worry about that. They can just partake in certain things. But a black person that is cognizant of his position in life, his stance, that fact that we are the not the dominant culture, that we're on the bottom and that we are dependent. We think about things like that. I hate the fact that black culture is dependent. Let me tell you something. If it was not for good natured white people, good natured Jewish people, you wouldn't have 80% of the black schools, organizations. Hell, the Martin Luther King Center was behind millions of dollars. Spelman College, Morris Brown, Tuskegee. I could go on and on. It's good natured white people who have made these institutions, who keep them existing. A lot of the HBCUs are existing not because of, of blacks, but because of whites and because of Jews. We had a black organization called, the, uh, we, I think we still have it, Black Nonbelievers of Atlanta that started in Atlanta. Most of our money didn't come from black people. What I would like as a black person is self-determination. I would like independence. And I don't think that we deal with that. Why? One of the biggest reasons is religion. See, religion keeps us from thinking about posterity. If you look at the Honda in Japan, the Japanese right after the war, 1945, 46, 47, or early 50s, they started working on that technology. We didn't get the Honda until about, what, late 70s or something like that? But that was posterity. They were thinking about that. The greatest love of all is to make, be in the process of making a very soft, comfortable bed that you know you're not going to live to lay in it to lie in it. You're not going to. Well, blacks don't prepare for the future or make steps right now that's going to affect us 50 years and 40 years later. Why? Because religion tells us, don't worry about it. As long as you have a personal relationship with Jesus, as long as you get to heaven, that doesn't matter. I'm not thinking about down the road. I'm thinking about my life now. And that is so anti-African. African is the village. You have people in Africa who would breastfeed other women, would breastfeed other children. There's no concept of cousin in Africa, pre-colonialism. The child of my brother and my sister is my child. But it's now it's uh, it's a personal thing. I have a personal relationship with God. I have a personal relationship with Jesus. Just, and it just takes away from the African ideology that I think is our greatest strength as black people to get back to who we are, to find out who we are. Because if you want equality, I'm sorry, ain't going to happen. Who would have thought that after Martin Luther King was killed, that we would be sitting here 2023 and we would still have the same net worth? Who would have thought that? I certainly didn't think so. I was five years old when he was killed. And I remember my parents talking to me about that. And I was, I was thinking, wow, we're, we're on the way now. How? Where? Where? Silicon Valley? Where? Do we own some things? Yes, we do. But as far as the economic gap, we are lagging far behind. Why? We don't know who we are. That's the problem. It is so comical to hear, you know, when I see a black person with a cross around their neck, I'm like, you're wearing the symbol of your conqueror. You are talking about Jesus. That is how you were conquered. Everywhere 
the conqueror, the colonizer went, he planted that cross. And if you look at my film, Holy Hierarchy, you'll see all that. I love that film. Not just because me and Marcus Reyes did it. He was my videographer and co-producer. But I love that film because it really addresses what's going on right now. Um, the other thing that is a privilege, we can walk around and we can complain about the monuments out here. Oh, I'm, they take that slate. Like I live not far from Stone Mountain and there's a push to get the imagery off of what, who is he? Uh, Robert E. Lee and all of these Confederate people, right? Andrew Jackson, whatever. I don't have a problem with that. That's history. That happened. You still today in Stone Mountain see vestiges of the Ku Klux Klan where they used to meet in headquarters. I know because I did the uh, sanitation. I worked, I started out, that was my first job when I came to Atlanta, uh, driving the sanitation and people would ask me what I did. I drove the, 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 the garbage truck and I say that I'm sanitation engineer, specialist and consultant. <laughs> but you still see some of those vestiges. Jeremiah Kamara has no problem with any of these monuments, Confederate monuments. How is it that you can complain about these monuments, but you say nothing when you see white Jesuses everywhere you go. Church, listen, let's all need, leave now, take a field trip. Let's go to Walgreens. Let's go to CVS. I guarantee you, you look in the magazine section, you'll see a white Jesus. I guarantee it. Schools, churches, hospitals, gas stations, it's everywhere, airports. I was in the Miami airport and they had the, just this, this display of white Jesus. That is insulting. That is about as insulting as it gets because you talk about, you know, white said, what can we do? Complain about that. Imagery is powerful. You remember how you go to the dentist and the doctor's office and he had that Bible book there? Open that book up. We're old enough to know about that blue Bible book that's in the dental office. Open that book up and you'll see it. If you ride from where I'm at in Atlanta to Florida, just the tip of Florida, and you go through a place called Tifton, there are dozens of billboards with white Jesuses. If you go in black churches, there are white Jesuses stained in the window. The fan that they give you to, to, to stay cool, has white Jesus on there. You can't get any more insulting. You blacks do not know who they are. We have made an incredible contribution to the world in any area that you can imagine. But we're not focusing on that. We're focusing on Jesus. So when I see a black person and I see, you know, a cross or I see them with this religious stuff, I'm like, damn, you know, is my work in vain? Like, what, what is all this for? And we're never going to make strides like that. The only way that you're going to make strides, that black people will make strides in this country, we've tried everything. You're not going to reach anybody with your heart. That's not going to work. We tried that during the Civil War. It's not going to be through marching. It's not going to be through singing. It's not going to be through praying. None of that. We tried all that. It's not going to work. Racism has to be because if you don't have racism, you render slavery in vain. That was not in vain. That was for a reason. That was to have an upper class, a hierarchical class, somebody on the top and somebody on the bottom. But I remember Martin Luther King saying this. He said, the only way you could be on the bottom is if you look up. I don't, I don't feel like I'm lacking anything. 
as a black person. I'm very proud of who I am. I love everything about me. I love everything about my family. I love it. So there's no jealousy. I want to be like, I want what they have, you know. I'm not trying to be equal. I'm trying to be myself. It's trying to be Jeremiah Kamara. And that's what blacks need to focus on. This poor guy, Eric, I don't know why I'm looking at this, looking for Eric out. I don't know why. I keep thinking he's on here. Yeah, but I, I just hope he's watching. But it's a shame in New York City, you put your ignorance on display. There are 20 million people here. What are you doing? Shut up. You, you, I mean, you are, you are advocating your conqueror. And listen, maybe, I don't know, I don't know. Maybe if blacks had had the weaponry, maybe we would have done the same thing. I don't know. We were children of the sun, and there were people who say, well, you know, people of the sun, they just behave differently. I don't know, because there are some atrocious things that blacks do to one another in Africa. Atrocious. So to say what we would or would not do, I don't know about that. You know, I do know this. When you start out, and I got to wrap it up because I know I got to get to the airport, but I'm okay for right now because, I mean, like I said, I don't know what a 20-minute talk is. <laughs> but when you're in Africa, right, and you cross north of the Sahara, what happens? You run into different animals, animals you can domesticate. I don't care how much a zebra looks like a horse, quacks like a horse, you can't mount him. <laughs> He's not going to let you mount him. But there are certain animals that you can domesticate, camels that can create trade routes and stuff like that, certain food now that you can store, increase brain size, whatever. There are certain experiences that when people left out of Africa and went north, they had to learn how to cure diseases. They had to learn how to get warm. They had to invent things. What they say that invention, uh, uh, necessity is the mother of invention. They had to be creative. Blacks in this country are descendant of those who did not go north of the Sahara. I don't know what that means, but I'm just saying, there is a certain amount of knowledge that was gained. Well, why didn't, why didn't, you know, it's, if you look at why Tibet and Nepal and China was never colonized by Europeans. Look at the extreme uh, uh, obstacles that were in their way, the mountains. You just can't go over the Nepalese and Tibetan mountains and the Himalayan mountains. That's not even worth it. But you travel north and you learn. So when you came back to Africa, when Europeans came back to colonize, it was almost like Leaving Mississippi, leaving, you know, you're born in Mississippi, you leave and you go to New York. When you come back to Mississippi, you're going to look at those people like they're kind of slow, like I'm from the big city, you know. So the colonizers came back to Africa. Oh, they're undeveloped. <laughs> King Leopold and Cecil Rhodes, and we're going we're gonna to take, they're undeveloped. That's what happened. That is what happened. They came back and they saw black people, not as equal, but as undeveloped. Under, how's, what's the word? Am I, am I gonna make up a word here? Under intellectualized, I don't know. But they just saw not as, as, as equal. And there are many whites right now. I remember it was a program that came on Fox. It was back in like the, 80s, I think. It was called, Are Blacks Better Athletes? The way that was worded suggests that blacks are 
better athlete, because you didn't say a white's better athlete, you worded it like that, right? And they interviewed this one guy, he was like, yeah, he was playing basketball as a black guy, he was like, yeah, I, you know, when I, I see a white guy in front of me, I think I can take him to the hole, you know, I think I can get him. That's the way whites see blacks intellectually. They say, well, you know, I, I, I think I can get him up here because of the fact that I am white. My God is white. If you see images of Jesus and he's white and it's made in your image, what a psychological advantage to think that my God is of my ethnicity. What a psychological disadvantage for black people to see that. And many blacks believe that. And so that's why you, they had a talk at one of the um, atheist conventions in Memphis. I think it was a man named James Comer. I think he was from England. And he had a talk. And he said, black, that white men have a complex of, uh, uh, of knowing it all. That if you have a group of blacks and then you know, a white man comes along, he's going to tell you exactly what it is. And this is a white guy, James Comer, doing this. I'll be 60 years old in March. You think I haven't noticed that? <laughs> you think I don't know that? You could be having a conversation, a white man will come along and he will sum it up. That's the history of this world. That's where we are. And I don't really think there's a right or a wrong. I really don't. I think that, you know, my son sent me, I'm gonna wrap it up here, but my son sent me this uh, video about 10 years ago. And it was this hyena that attacked this wildebeest. This wildebeest, she was, she was pregnant. And these, this hyena, he got wind of it. Then they smelled it, you know, that she's about to deliver, and they came and disemboweled her and ate her for breakfast, her calves and everything. And I looked at that, and I was so glad my son sent me that because it taught me a lot. You can learn a lot from animals. You really can. After the hell that white people went through, especially in 1347 to 1349, where almost an entire continent was wiped out due to the bubonic plague and diseases. One out of two birth rate. They went through hell. Blacks are not the only people that have gone through hell. Whites have went through hell too. A lot of things happened in Europe. So after that happened, White said, never again. We're not going to allow that again. So once they have superior weaponry, they did what they thought they needed to do in order for that never to happen again. Jews have a slogan. They say, never again. They were evicted from, what, 22 or 23 places. And if you look at the map, it kind of hugs the coast. So you know they were on foot. And you look at how a Jew behaves right now. If you are Jewish, you are invited. If you're another Jew, they have a sense of love for other Jews. I wish black people had that. You could have, I could be walking in the whitest town. I was in Salt Lake City back in 2014. I'm walking down the street. There's a black person walking down the street. I looked at him. He didn't even speak to me. I'm like, damn, man, ain't many of us here in Salt Lake City. <laughs> you know, that's where we are mentally. And so I've been to many places, and the whites raised their hands and said, what can we do? Well, I'm going to ask that question now. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> and I know that's harsh, but I would like to complain about the white imagery of Jesus that is around because it starts with us. Our issues, listen, if you're going to measure the circumference of a circle where we got pi and we did all these measurements, the diameter and the 
the radius and all that, and you got this 3.1, it goes on forever. You have to start with the circle itself. In order for blacks to have a remedy to their problem, we have to start with ourselves. And part of that has to do with letting this religion go. It has nothing to do with us. Letting the holidays, letting all of that go and embracing yourself. It does not mean you're anti anybody else. It just means the hell that you've been through as a black person, you need to love another black person. And I think once that happens, we will be okay. It may take years. So listen, I know what I have said is, was harsh or whatever, but that's where I am right now, through, through the years. That's my position right now, because I don't see any other way out of this. I really don't. And I just don't think that, I think that right now this age that we're in is the golden age of appeasement. Hell, we took over the Super Bowl at halftime last year, took over the Super Bowl this year. We're everywhere. It, blacks are everywhere. You see us on Netflix. We are all over the place. You would think like, wow, you guys have really come up. Don't let the smooth taste fool you. Economically, we're on the bottom. We are still dependent. We have not, are not standing on our own two feet in any capacity. So I just wanted to bring that up to give us some understanding as to where we are right now. I appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. Thank you for that very, very powerful, very provocative, very challenging talk. Uh, so much to learn from that. Normally we would have a period of questions and answers, but given the fact that he also has to rush for the airport right after this, we're going to have to move through. And then what I invite you to do is to check out all of his stuff online, which is pretty extensive. Uh, and he has, what is, um, what is your next documentary going to be coming out, by the way? Probably the fall. This fall? Uh, but do check out Holy Hierarchy. Look at some of his other materials, and there is a lot, lot there um, for us to have conversations with, and also to um, to reflect upon. I suppose there are two kind of important announcements that we just need to point out. Um, the first is that in your program, you were given uh, paver. Um, installation. We're trying to raise some awareness from that, but our primary thing is to honor your loved ones. So you will, so we will hold this May 28th. We're going to be having a Memorial Day weekend. We will hold our next paper installation ceremony uh, at that time. Uh, as you're aware, the inscribed bricks on our paved path to the Meeting House communicate our love for departed friends and family, the joy of honoring significant events of our lives and our pride in the society's accomplishments and values. You may purchase an inscribed brick by using the order form in your program, and those on you on Zoom land can obtain an order form by calling our office at 201-836-5187. I'm sure David will put that on there, or emailing uh, our administrator at ethicalfocus.org. And the deadlines for submitting for brick inscriptions this year is May 15, 2023. So May 15th coming up pretty quick. The second thing is that the skills auction is coming up. Um, it's our major, our biggest social and fundraising event in the Bergen Ethical Society calendar, and it's open to all members and their friends. You can bid in person or have someone bid for you on dinners, hikes, museums, game night, basketball tickets, ping pong afternoons, stays at peaceful retreats, delicious homemade foods, artwork, tours, and more. Uh, there are door prizes and also refreshments. The donors of each event will determine safety protocols for their activity or event. They get to determine masking or unmasking and testing uh, protocols will be specified for each of those group activities offered in the catalog, which is due to be mailed in mid-April, so look out for that. 
Uh, the event will be on May 6th of this year at 5.30 p.m. There will be sign-ups and refreshments. A live auction starts at 6.30 p.m. And RSVP to your punch bowl invitation and submit your auction contribution by March 24th. So if you want to hold something or sell something or offer something, please get it to Mary Matsui by March 24th. You can check Focus for weekly announcements for details and offerings. And rapid tests will be required that day, as we've done with Winterfest. You'll come in. You'll either supply testing or you'll be tested then or that. And uh, we'll be explaining more of that as it comes on. I now want to uh, invite our band up for their second piece of music. But before that, thanks to everyone. Uh, Susan, are you alerting to me something? Yeah. There we go. So it's right inside your program of the words. Uh, this is really incredible that Jesse is able to uh, compose such beautiful stuff. Jesse, it's just absolutely fantastic. And thanks to her band for making this possible. So let's help them by joining in the singing of uh, Mosaic. Pictures clear. We stand together, and the road goes year after year. We stand together, but not as one. Higher power and 
Our closing words come from Eustace Hayden, who was an ethical culture leader in Chicago, who said that history will not condemn us if our dreams are too daring. It will properly blame us if we lack the courage, intelligence, and goodwill to build up the limits of our powers. Uh, I think that resonates with the talk for the day. And thank you all for coming. And uh, please join us in a little social time. Thank you so much. I'll ask the meeting room to drop off and I will uh, let all the people on Zoom unmute if they'd like. Let me uh, do that. Give me one second. Okay, you're all welcome to unmute if you'd like. Hope you enjoyed this talk it was a great talk and last night we sh we showed his movie uh it was, which was a terrific film really terrific film and i recommend it it's on amazon prime i put the name of it in the chat window so i can't hear you very well pam i didn't say anything oh someone was, <laughs> someone was talking uh, you're all welcome to unmute themselves yourself if you'd like to talk Hello, Naomi. Hi there. If you're an Amazon Prime member, you can watch Jeremiah's movie for free. And that other movie he's talking about I, that he's making now, I don't know when that's coming out. I don't think he has a date yet. But he's got a lot of YouTube videos also. Mm-hmm. Hi, all. Bye, all. Hi, Perry. Bye, Perry. Bye, bye. <laughs> well, if uh, no one ha by the way, uh, the, if you're dialed in, you can unmute by pressing star six. I know we have one person dialed in. Okay, well, oh, Karen, Karen Grissom, your hand is up. I don't know if that was an accident or if you want to say something, but go ahead. Actually, I just wanted to say um, great presentation. And I Thank did prom promise everybody that I would do my camera, but it looks like you have a combination of me and a beautiful place. That's on right. On the Oregon coast, um, Hug Point, and <laughs> great presentation. <laughs> it's your supernatural. Uh, it's a supernatural Karen Grissom, right? It's it's a nurturing place, and <laughs> and Oregon citizens, our coast is one hundred percent public. There is no private ownership. Oh, that is terrific. You know, Directly. you know, here in New Jersey, well, I'm not sure how many are private, but they're even the ones that are public, you usually have to pay. You often, unless it's a state park or a national park, you have to pay a tag fee to use them. But at least they're public, but you still have to pay. But where I grew up in California, I grew up in Southern California, and many wealthy people, and the beaches there are supposed to be public. But what's happened like in Malibu is that wealthy people bought up these properties and have restricted access. And for, I moved away th uh, 40 years ago, 30 years ago. And when I lived there, there were fights over it and there's still fights over it. They just don't want to give up their private beaches. Um, yes, we left California in 77, mm -hmm. and I spent 10 years in Washington before coming here. Ah, 